This is the closing presentation for this training course. This presentation covers a variety of topics, including loading partitions, hydraulic gradients for the internal erosion processes, how to combine probabilities in assessing modifications. Loading partitions. Flood and earthquake loading partitions must be carefully considered and discussed as a team. The partitions must, must capture where changes in performance are expected, in other words, inflection points. It is important to note that partitions can vary from failure mode to failure mode, and even from node to node for a given failure mode. Different loading partitions may be considered for each component of the risk equation, hazard or loading, performance or potential failure modes, and consequences. The selection of the loading partitions directly affects any supporting analysis to be performed and the subjective probability estimates during a team elicitation. Several factors to consider when selecting loading partitions are shown on this slide. Always evaluate performance up to the embankment crest, even if the probable maximum flood is at a lower elevation. Other potential inflection points include major changes in the foundation profile, changes in the embankment cross-section, past performance thresholds, record stage, top of active storage, etc. The top figure is an example of a design change with the embankment cross-section that occurs at 1 in 1,000 AEP, with a partial height impervious core and chimney filter. Flow-through rock fill can occur above the impervious core. The bottom figure is an example of a design change that occurs at 1 in 50 AEP with a partial height chimney filter. Many USACE filters were designed for slope stability considerations not defensive measures against cracking in the upper part of the embankment. As a result, an unfiltered exit exists above this elevation. As with any node in an event tree, provide the rationale for each loading partition to provide a clear understanding of its significance. The first table is an example of concise rationales for reservoir pool partitioning. If tailwater significantly influences performance, provide its rationale in a similar manner as shown in the bottom table. As illustrated by these example curves, the conditional probability of failure could have a wide range of shapes. For a good levy, the probability of failure may remain low and reliability remain high until floodwater elevation is rather high. In contrast, a poor levy may experience greatly reduced reliability when subjected to even a small flood head. The actual curve may be closer to an S shape or intermediate curve, which is similar in shape to the good case for the small floods, but reverses to approach the poor case for floods of significant height. A straight line function is also shown, representing a linear relation between reliability and flood height. Linearity would not be expected to be the general case. After estimating all probabilities for the event tree, plot the system response curve and review its shape to confirm it makes sense and is consistent with the team's understanding of the estimated performance. Can inflection points and abrupt changes be explained? Are additional points needed to provide better resolution? In the example at the top left, the system response probability, or SRP, remains constant with increasing stage. For example, it could reach a SRP of 1 or tailwater rises, reducing gradients such that the SRP can no longer rise. In the example in the bottom left, it's a brittle system, a threshold stage where performance changes dramatically. Are sufficient points defined over small but critical ranges of stages? In the example at the top middle, the SRP abruptly increases then continues on the same initial trend. Is there a physical explanation for increasing SRP by an order of magnitude at a pool of record? In the example in the bottom middle, tailwater reduces gradient. Since stage has already passed through a higher SRP at lower stage, timing and rate of progression are important. 
If progression is fast and tailwater rises slow, the SRP may not come down as much or at all. At the top right, this is an example that has actually been seen. This cannot happen. The example in the bottom right shows the questions to ask are, are sufficient stages evaluate to identify inflection points? Hydraulic gradients. The hydraulic gradient influences the likelihood of initiation and in some cases progression of each of the five internal erosion processes. For concentrated leak erosion, it is used to estimate hydraulic shear stress for initiation. For backward erosion piping, it includes vertical exit gradient for initiation and horizontal gradient for progression. For suffusion, it includes exit gradient for initiation. For soil contact erosion, it is used to estimate, estimate Darcy velocity for initiation. For internal migration, a vertical downward gradient is required. Direct use of critical velocities or gradients determined from laboratory experiments is limited by the narrow range of materials tested and an apparent significant scale effect. For backward erosion piping, initiation is governed by Terzaghi's classical equation for critical vertical gradient, whereas the average gradient informs the hydraulic condition for progression. For scour, you cannot just discuss hydraulic gradient. For concentrated leak erosion, hydraulic shear stress is a function of hydraulic gradient as well as pipe or crack geometry, and the critical shear stress is dependent on erodibility. For soil contact erosion, the Darcy velocity is a function of hydraulic gradient and horizontal permeability, and the critical velocity is based on a theoretical critical value from exper experiments which is a function of particle size and porosity. For suffusion, in many of the internally unstable soils tested, gradients to initiate erosion are so high that they are unlikely to occur in dams, levees, or their foundations. Laboratory testing is needed with flow horizontal and inclined to better define the gradients at which erosion initiates. For internal migration, a downward gradient is needed to move eroded particles into the open defect. There also needs to be enough seepage gradient in the defect to transport eroded particles to the exit. When preparing more and less likely factors, do not use qualitative terms like low gradient. Backward erosion piping can progress with average gradients as low as 0.02 to 0.05 in fine to medium uniform sands. Always specify hydraulic head difference over seepage path link, or H over L. Don't just provide the numerical value of gradient. This assists with quality control reviews and helps to clearly communicate seepage path link. Discuss key assumptions and parameters for estimation of critical gradients. You cannot just discuss gradient for concentrated leak erosion. Gradient must be discussed in the context of erodibility along with the assumed dimensions. In this example, concentrated leak erosion may be likely to occur in highly erodible soils such as silts, silty sands, or dispersive clays at crack widths of 0.25 to 0.5 inch under a hydraulic gradient as low as 0.1, or crack widths as small as one or two millimeters under hydraulic gradients of 0.5 or more. Clays may not be likely to erode until cracks reach one or two inches in width and hydraulic gradients approach 0.5 or more. Hydraulic shear stress is the parameter that drives initiation, and it is a function of hydraulic gradient, unit weight of water, and the pipe or crack geometry. The top table illustrates how the hydraulic shear stress increases with both increasing hydraulic gradient and pipe diameter. The hydraulic shear stress is then compared to a critical value. Critical shear stress is a difficult parameter to estimate, and the range is often an order of magnitude or more, as shown in the bottom table. This table further illustrates the influence of the likelihood of initiation of concentrated leak erosion as a function of soil type, crack width, and hydraulic gradient in the crack. It shows the probability of initiation in one millimeter, 
two millimeter and five millimeter wide cracks for different soil types. Dispersive soils have similar probabilities of initiation as ML and SM soils. Erodibility increases from upper right to lower left in the table. For each crack width, likelihood increases from top to bottom with increasing hydraulic gradient. Combining probabilities. Careful consideration must be given when combining probabilities of failure. For failure modes that are not mutually exclusive, the total probabilities of failure for the event tree should be calculated using De Morgan's rule. For a given internal erosion process, for example, internal migration into open rock defects, if the embankment profile is divided into segments or different cross sections are evaluated, for example, due to physical differences in geology, geometry, treatment, etc., the individual system response curves should be combined into a single system response curve by selecting the maximum probability of failure at each loading partition. The maximum probability governs the overall performance. For a given internal erosion process, for example, concentrated leak erosion due to a transverse crack in the embankment, develop system response curves for each flow path, for example, above and below a filter, above and below the top of a berm, etc. The individual system response curves should be combined into a single system response curve by selecting the maximum probability of failure at each loading partition. With levees, breach in one location does not necessarily preclude breach in another like it does for a dam. For failure modes of the same internal erosion process, use to Morgan's rule, or depending on the consequences, consider the intersecting event, which would be both reaches failing at the same time. The flow path length for hydraulic gradient calculations can vary with embankment cross-section. This slide provides examples of multiple flow paths to be considered for concentrated leak erosion through an embankment based on design changes in the cross-section. At the top left, this dam has a thin partial height impervious core with pervious shells. Flow path A above the core could be backward erosion piping and the roadway acts as a roof or seepage induced sloughing of, down, of the downstream face. Flow path B is concentrated leak erosion through the core, but the pervious shell may or may not provide a filtered exit. In addition, if the pervious shell has excessive fines, common cause cracking may occur, resulting in an unfiltered exit at the downstream face. At the bottom left, this is a homogeneous dam with a partial height inclined chimney filter. Flow path A is above the elevation of the filter and has an unfiltered exit for concentrated leak erosion at the downstream face. Flow path B has a filtered exit at the inclined chimney filter. At the top right, this dam has three design changes that must be considered. Flow path A has an unfiltered exit for concentrated leak erosion at the downstream face. Flow path B has concentrated leak erosion through the thin impervious core, but the pervious shell may or may not provide a filtered exit. In addition, if the pervious shell has excessive fines, common cause cracking may occur, resulting in an unfiltered exit at the downstream face. Flow path C is concentrated leak erosion through the impervious core and has a filtered exit at the inclined chimney filter. At the bottom right, this dam has no filters and the downstream berm lengthens the flow path for concentrated leak erosion. The crack depth D may span two different flow paths. The suggested approach is to assess two crack depths individually. One, the base of the crack is at the top of the inclined chimney filter, and two, the base of the crack extends below the top of the inclined chimney filter to the maximum crack depth. As discussed in the concentrated leak erosion presentation, the equivalent flow path length varies for each scenario. The individual system response curves from two crack depth scenarios can be combined into a single system response curve by using the maximum system response probability at each water level. Assessing modifications. 
The formulation of structural risk reduction measures to address failure modes will focus on one or more nodes of the event tree to reduce the likelihood of their occurrence. These are the nodes that are typically targeted for backward erosion piping. Structural risk reduction measures must either interrupt the continuous flow path, provide a filtered exit, or reduce hydraulic gradients. These are the nodes that are typically targeted for concentrated leak erosion in the embankment. Providing a filter as a defensive measure is the most effective structural risk reduction measure. Modifications to the upstream cross section can also be performed. To achieve flow limitation, an upstream facing element could be constructed. To provide crack filling action, an upstream cohesionless zone could be provided, but it must work in conjunction with a downstream zone that is filter compatible. These are the nodes that are typically targeted for concentrated leak erosion along the embankment foundation contact with the installation of a cutoff wall. A cutoff wall effectively addresses the continuity of the flaw and introduces significant benefit of flow limitation if there is a construction defect in the wall. However, the concentrated leak erosion failure mode becomes non-credible and internal migration becomes the failure mode. Therefore, stable roof is not applicable for stoping and the breach mechanism becomes sinkhole development. Installation of structural risk reduction measures, like cutoff walls, can also introduce new failure modes as the flow regime is changed. This presentation discusses the first three failure modes listed here. In the left figure, the bending moment on the barrier at the top of rock is higher due to the stiffness contrast between the soil and rock and may cause barrier cracking. At the embankment foundation interface, concentrated seepage pathways are more likely due to a concentration of gravelly soils at the base of the alluvium or differential movement between the embankment soils and rock. Similarly, the coincidence of a crack in the seepage barrier and a seepage pathway may occur where barrier cracking occurs at the interface between rock types with different stiffnesses, where bedrock jointing also often occurs. The middle figure shows hydraulic fracture on the downstream side of a barrier due to elevated water pressures from flow through the defect in the barrier. Hydraulic fracture can also be caused by high water pressures on the upstream side of the barrier and leakage through the defect stress redistribution in the core during barrier construction or post-construction deformation. In the right figure, the barrier is constructed through a zone of high conductivity and a large gradient is imposed on the uncured concrete, which erodes finer portions of the concrete mix before curing, resulting in a segregated concrete backfill. This mechanism can develop where concentrated flow occurs through bedrock joints beneath or at the ends of the barrier. Increased water pressure developed due to the seepage barrier will reduce the effective stress on the joint and has the potential to dilate the joint and initiate seepage pathways through the bedrock that were previously not significant. The increased gradient along the joint also increases the potential for erosion of joint infilling. If the barrier is installed too shallow and continuous open rock defects pass beneath the barrier, collapse of the embankment fill and underlying alluvium can also occur, leading to sinkholes manifesting on the upstream or downstream slopes. In addition to this example of the flow path bypassing the barrier vertically, it is possible that the flow path could bypass the lateral extents of the barrier. In closing for this training course, there are lots of good references in addition to the Best Practices Manual. Fell et al. 2008 was a joint effort between the University of New South Wales, URS Australia, USACE, and Reclamation. It was a seminal document and a lot is still relevant. Benelli 2013 compiled information for soil contact erosion, backward erosion piping, and concentrated leak erosion from the primary authors who are working on ICODE Bulletin 164. 
Myself and Kevin Richards from USACE were co-authors along with other agency representatives for ICODs for FEMA 2015. Phil Atala 2008 and FEMA P1032 from 2015 can be downloaded from free from University of New South Wales and FEMA's publications websites. For USACE personnel, Benelli 2013 can be downloaded from Wiley's online library by chapter if connected to the USACE network. ICODE Bulletin 164 from 2017 can be downloaded from ICODE's publication website using USACE's USSD National Committee Code. Phil Atal 2015 is an overarching textbook, but it must be purchased. Zhang et al. 2016 is another overarching textbook and can be downloaded for free from Wiley's online library by chapter if connected to the USACE network. The RMC's website is still under development, but many of the tools and technical resources are or will be posted to www.rmc.usace.army.mil, including the best practices manual and various RMC software and tools. For, U for USACE, Reclamation, FERC, and TVA, a case history is presented at a monthly interagency web meeting. Amanda Duvenode is the RMC's point of contact. The extensive library of these presentations will eventually be posted to the RMC website. This concludes this presentation.